Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another author interview. This time is the author of The First Law, The Shattered Sea, and The Upcoming Devil. This is Lord Grimdark himself, Joe Abercrombie. Sir, how are things across the pond? They're okay. They're quite sunny, quite pleasant today, which is a rare thing. It's been right. rainy and gray, but we're having a little bit of a heat wave. Well, I mean, so rainy and gray, I feel like that's the kind of palette I feel like you kind of get when you read a First Law book. So that's, uh, that's appropriate, I think. I think. I said, well, you can have bloodshed and tragedy in the sun. All right, well, guys, so this is going to be mostly a spoiler-free discussion. So uh, if you haven't read the series, you'll be safe. And I realized I just cut Joe off, so I'm going to let him say what he was going to say. He probably had a really good one-liner, and I just cut him off. It's, just, it's a great start. No, I was just saying, you know, the sun, you can have bloodshed and tragedy in the sun, like with the Crusades, you know? That's, hey, this is very true. The sun don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't play favorites. Uh, before we start, I guess I'll get my fanboying out of the way here. I've been a fan of the series since 2008 and i feel like i've been kind of an advocate ever since i've been damn near forcing it on my family and loved ones you know and a couple of them have been like this is really great but most of them have been like what did you just have me read and things like that but i will always continue to to preach that gospel there so i just want to thank you all up front for creating what i consider to be my favorite modern modern fantasy world and series and obviously some of my favorite characters ever on page Oh, wow. Thank you very much for that. Lovely to hear. I guess we can conclude this interview now. That's it. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I was going to say, I was looking behind you at the books and I see you've got a couple of Pyre hardcovers. Uh, yeah, they're, they're book club editions because that was all I was able to find on a hard because I didn't discover the series in 2008. Yeah, I I'll tell you, I, had this, I was kind of having a Song of Ice and Fire hangover. And a friend of mine at the time, I was like, ah, there's nothing as good as Song of Ice and Fire. Right. But the guy doesn't write anything. And he's like, well, I really think you should check this out. And I'm like, well, first I got to know, is the series complete? And he's like, last book comes out this month. And I was like, okay, great. So I went ahead and got all three, but all I could find on hard, because at the time I was still such a snob, it's only hard covers, hard covers were death for me. So I, I looked these up and the only ones I could find on hardcover that weren't just exorbitant in price were, were, the, uh, were the, uh, the book club editions, but I'm fine with that. And then I couldn't yeah. like not get the Gallant's anniversary editions as well. So I mean- nice. I mean, this is nothing new. I have like six copies of Dune, you know, if it's a, if it's a book I love, I have no problem buying it again, you know. That's just... Yeah, yeah, because I think it didn't come out in the States till maybe 2008, 2007. Something and then like they that. came out six months, there were a couple, a couple of yeah, years. Yeah, now it's, you could always find, you could always find that, uh, it's like a three pack of like the trade paperbacks, but you can never find the hardcover. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of what I had to do. I mean, even these I had to, I had to order from Gallant's website, you know, in the UK. So yeah, right. they just, they're such, they're such bastards out here in the US. I can see why you don't do book tours out here. Well, I mean, I like going to the US. I've done, I've done a few things now and again, but it's just the distances as much as anything. You know, yeah. in the UK, if you do a tour, you can set off from home. You can do an event at lunchtime. You can do another in the evening and you can do that every day all around the UK because, you know, everywhere is so close to everywhere else. Whereas right. you go to the States, you got to fly from one city to another. You know, if you do one event a day, you're lucky. So you fly out there for a couple of weeks and you maybe do eight events the whole time. It's just that much harder to justify than it is here. Here you can really, you know, get to a lot of different places. Yeah. John, John going pretty much told me like the same thing about that. Yeah, sure. He'd love to come to the U S it just doesn't really make you know sense monetarily. Uh, the darkest yeah. fantasy I think I had read prior to your series was obviously a song of ice and fire. So I felt like I was prepared for what is known as grimdark now this is a community argument that does not ever seem to die it really is what is actually grimdark and i said well i got a guy on here that calls himself lord grimdark so who better to ask what is grimdark really i don't know i mean <laughs> it depends who you ask it depends who you ask and and you know i think the problem with grimdark as a as a describer of a genre is not only that it sounds kind of ridiculous which obviously is a slight problem but also no one agrees and it all depends. Whenever anyone want, wants to make an argument about what grimdark is, they kind of stick all the stuff that suits the argument into the grimdark bin and they take out all the stuff that doesn't. You know, so they'll say grimdark is this incredibly humorless, horrible stuff that, you know, where there's, there's never anything funny and therefore they've taken on the thing that's funny out. It's true, but only if you take all the funny stuff out. And, you know, for me, Grimdark didn't appear until quite a while after my first books came out. You know, people started using the word. I remember it being used, I don't know, I guess 2009, 2010, that kind of time. Um, and they used it as a pejorative, you know, to say if something was grimdark, they meant this is ridiculously over the top, edgelord, cynical, splatterpunk nonsense. You know, they thought it was ridiculous. They'd say things like, you know, the first law, that's grimdark, but 
Game of Thrones isn't because it's good. You know, that's, that's <laughs> what if it was good, it wasn't grimdark. And then I guess people kind of co-opted, you know, the, the word grimdark to apply to stuff they liked. And suddenly it started being used about, you know, a whole style of fantasy that seemed to develop around that time that I guess is, is cynical, is violent, is gritty, has people pissing a lot, has people swearing a lot, you know. So it's it's morally and physically kind of filthy a reaction to the shiny, optimistic, heroic fantasy of the of the eighties and nineties, I guess. So in that in that sense, Game of Thrones is kind of a step in that direction. But since then, there've obviously been people kind of pushing that envelope in in various ways, in in more cynical directions, in darker, more kind of unpleasant directions in, in Lovecraft in almost horror kind of directions. But everyone has a different idea what it means. And that's why it's not that useful to, to kind of use when you're arguing about anything. I mean, I call myself Lord Grimdark. Obviously I am a real Lord, you know, that goes without saying. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I did that purely as a joke because at the time it seemed self evidently a joke, you know, no one would claim to be a Lord of such a stupid thing. And then suddenly people started taking it seriously. And now people occasionally will think that I actually am declaring myself to be Lord of this notional genre, which- I say embrace it, go for it. Well, why not? You know, I think I've earned it. I think I've earned it, right? Okay, I got a couple of the the greatest hits as I call them here. Obviously, Mm -hmm. the biggest question that I got from people is who would you say is your primary influence as an author? Well, I mean, primary is tough because you know everyone's a tapestry of many threads when it comes to authorial influence and you know a lot of those are book ones for me but they're all kinds of other ones too you know filmic influences and video games and tv and life experiences of one kind or another I mean Tolkien is the sort of the granddaddy as he is for most authors of my age I would imagine most fantasy authors you know Tolkien is where I really started to get fascinated by fantasy and, and gripped by fantasy. And I'd read The Lord of the Rings every year for, for you know, my teenage years. Um, and then I started getting into a lot of other similar things, you know, Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea, Michael Moorcock's Corum and uh, Elric and, you know, uh, much more commercial kind of straight ahead stuff like, uh, you know, Dragonlance and David Eddings and these kind of things. So I was reading a huge amount of this stuff in my teens. And then I started reading all kinds of other stuff outside of fantasy, you know, and writers like James Elroy writing, you know, revisionist noir and uh, Cormac McCarthy and Larry McMurtry writing kind of revisionist Westerns, you know, and then a whole kind of spread of other stuff from sort of Dickens and Austin and classics of that kind through to some Russian literature some Tolstoy and Bulgakov and people like that, whose names I drop in order to make me seem cleverer than I am. I'm saying uh, it works. Uh, these are some answers I weren't, I was not expecting. So this is pretty thanks, good. Thanks, man. Um, but then, you know, also a lot of films, you know, so, so when I, I came to write the standalone books, they were sort of based around some filmic influences, stuff like, uh, you know, John Borman's Point Blank. It's a weird gangster film from the seventies with Lee Marvin. And, you know, it has this sort of revenge motif with a good twist towards the end. And I always loved that film. So that was kind of the, the seed for best served cold. And then, a Bridge Too Far and similar war films like that with a focus on failure and, and failed planning. That was sort of part of the inspiration for the heroes. I'd always love Westerns like, you know, Unforgiven, The Arnold Josie Wales and uh, My Darling Clementine, all this kind of stuff. And that was the influences for Red Country. So there's a big old spread. We could talk all day about the influences, I'm sure. No, you bring up Red Country for sure. I got a lot of uh, Sergio Leone, Clint Eastwood movies there for sure, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, what would you say, gun to your head, favorite fantasy series ever? You can only pick one. If I can only pick one, you see, then, then I want to start picking different ones for different reasons. <laughs> if I can only pick one, Lord of the Rings, because, you know, that is the, the wellspring from which it all flows. But uh, for sure, you know, A Game of Thrones, that book specifically was a huge thing for me. Um, yeah, right in the sense introduction that, that you did for the re-release in the, in the 80s and 90s and um you know felt like everything had become quite predictable quite shiny quite heroic the commercial heart of the genre really was was that way and uh so game of thrones really turned the light on for me 
you know, it was a bit of a light bulb moment because I saw that you could do something shocking and character focused and, you know, surprising and new within that very much that, you know, umbrella of epic fantasy that I'd always loved. And so I think, you know, without that book, I'm not sure I'd ever have really written myself or at least what I've written would have been very different and a lot less interesting probably. Yeah, I think I read your introduction for A Game of Thrones was the re-release. Was it the illustrated edition? You had an introduction in that one? Yeah. Yeah, the folio edition. Yeah, I did I did an intro very, for very nice. Um do you think it's fair when people say that they feel like First Law is a deconstruction of Lord of the Rings? Do you think that's fair? I don't think it's unfair. I mean, as long as anyone's talking about it, I'm kind of happy with anything they say in a way. <laughs> and that's very as far as things that have been said about the first law, that's one of the most positive ones. Right. So uh, no, I don't complain. And it was it was on my mind for sure. Um, it was a deconstruction at Lord of the Rings. I mean, and not just Lord of the Rings so much as the kind of, I mean, it's probably more a deconstruction of David Eddings, of, of the Belgariad, you know. In a way, Lord of the Rings isn't quite what people sort of assume it is or imagine it might be thinking back. You know, Lord of the Rings is a lot more complicated and shaded, I think, than people that it some, sometimes gets credit for. And stuff like the Belgariad that is very heroic, very shiny, good guys and bad guys. Um, I think that's the kind of thing I was thinking of. But also, you know, those big archetypes are bigger than any one book, you know, those big archetypes like the, the big wizardly mentor. I mean, Gandalf, Merlin, Belgarath, they're big, big figures, right? And so they were sort of just the big figures of fantasy. The man, the, the used up man of violence, the boy with a special destiny, you know, magic swords, the evil empire that threatens the, the noble kingdom, all that sort of stuff. Classic stuff I was just, you know, wanting to mess around with and have fun with. So it was no one thing, but I think a deconstruction of Lord of the Rings isn't, isn't too far from the mark. Yeah, I think a lot of people expected uh, Baez. Oh, this is the Gandalf character. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. how things went with them. So I think. That's well, you know, I was, I was answering a, a question earlier along these lines uh, in in, a, in an interview I was doing by email, and um, I was saying that in the in the edition of Lord of the Rings that I had growing up, uh, there was a foreword by Tolkien, and he was talking about being asked whether Lord of the Rings was an allegory for the world wars, and he'd said, uh, you know, if it had been then Gandalf would have used the ring. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, right. You know, and, uh, I think Gandalf is quite a scary character. You know, he has a divine mission. So he is right. He is right. He's absolutely right. You never have to doubt that he's right. But if you were to doubt that he's right, he very quickly becomes quite a terrifying figure. So, you know, that was some of the inspiration right there. Sounds like a good what if episode. Uh, so what are you currently reading right now? I'm currently reading several extremely boring things. Uh, I'm reading a history of Byzantium. I'm reading a history of relics uh, and a history of saints. Um, Cause I read a lot of nonfiction about obscure subjects that are tangentially related to what I'm writing. Um, and so those three give you some sort of insight into what my next book might feature. Right. Other than that, I mean, I don't know if there's any fiction I've got on the go. I don't read very much fantasy at all, almost none. It feels too much like work these days. It's very hard to turn off that part of my brain that is always saying, oh, I'd write that differently, I'd change that, I'd shift that to there, you know, because I'm so used to reading my own stuff and reading it in that analytical way, it's very hard to turn that analytical part of my brain off. Very rare are the things that can kind of pull me out and just make me enjoy it naturally and without, without worrying. And generally, the closer to what I do they are, the harder it is to, to read and enjoy them. You know, so weird and wonderful, strange fantasy that is very unlike the kind of epic stuff that I write. I can still read and enjoy. So I read like Gideon the Ninth recently and really enjoyed that. It's a very different kind of th to the thing that I, very different kind of thing to what I write. Um, but epic fantasy, I find quite hard to lose myself in. It makes a lot of sense. I was reading a Malazan book recently. There's a big part about like the, the financial economy of the time. I was like, I feel like I'm at work right now. So I didn't really enjoy those parts. So I, yeah, I, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right, how about some of these viewer questions now? Now the question I got, without a doubt, the most 
is are you done with the first law universe after wisdom of crowds? No, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know for, for definite. So there's no uh, immediate plan to do anything in the first law world. There's no contract. There's and, and you know, what I do next will be something else for sure. Um, once I've been away, maybe I'll feel the call to come back. Kind of depends a little bit. Um, but I don't think there's any reason why it has to be kind of the end at all. You know, I'm not a writer who's massively into the world building side of it. You probably won't be shocked and amazed to hear. You know, I'm more interested in the characters, the story, the action, the things that fantasy has in common with everything else in a way than I am in the things that, you know, separate fantasy from everything else, the magic and the world building, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm not necessarily a writer who needs to have new sets. Doesn't seem a lot of point smashing the sets up in order just to build a new set of sets. You know, I'm not making some big point with the world. I'm not, you know, having a world in which, you know, the magic plays a certain role and, and makes the story a certain way, you know. So there's always room for new, different stories in the first law world. I quite enjoy having that background, that history, both the deeper history and the immediate history of characters that we've seen in the past. All those characters, those relationships to draw on is, is kind of a useful resource. So... You know, if I'm going to write straight ahead epic fantasy, I think it's hard to think of a reason why I wouldn't do it in this world um, and just continue to develop the world. So I think, yeah, there, there very well may be more books. I mean, I think it'd be standalone books, probably visit some corners of the world that I haven't necessarily uh, brought into play before. Do some stories, uh, you know, some individual stories scattered around the place. And then who knows, maybe one day come back for another trilogy. Okay, well, would you consider those maybe as like a, out of sequence, out of timeline order? Like, for example, in Age of Madness, this is a very light spoiler, guys. You don't really need to know very much about this. But uh, you get the mentions of these wars, these multiple wars that Styria and Adua have had the time between Red Country and a little hatred. Personally, mm -hmm. I love Best Served Cold, so I would love to see some of that stuff and see some of those Styrian characters again, things like that. So would you, would you consider that? Because most of your stories do seem to continue this timeline going forward. Yeah. So would you ever take a step back and say, hey, this takes place here? Or do you just feel like that would confuse people? Well, I mean, I've obviously done a few short stories that are scattered around the timeline and, you know, I've used those to fill in some blanks here and there. Um, but I'm not a big fan of prequels mm. on the whole. I mean, you know, never say never. And if you've got a great idea, then then you've got a great idea that you need to pursue. But generally for me, you know, prequels are what happens when you've slightly run out of ideas. And the problem with prequels is they always or nearly always feel like they're lesser than the thing they're the prequel to. They're an add-on, they're a fill-in, you know? And of course, you have the fundamental problem that basically the audience know what happened, or at least they've got some idea. They know some things that have happened since. So, you know, it's harder to do twists and surprises. I mean, if you can do a prequel in a way that genuinely sets the original story in a new light, that shows you some element of the original story you, you didn't know, that makes you see the whole thing differently. That's brilliant, but you've almost got to design the original thing with that in mind. You know, it's very hard to, to reverse engineer something as, as kind of sophisticated as that. Um, if you're just filling in the blanks of a story that you were told kind of in passing, I don't know how interesting that is. I mean, why not go forward? What's the difference? You can just go forward, can't you? And, and move, move the clock on. And then who knows what's going to happen, you know? So if I was going to go back to Styria, I think I'd probably set the story after Age of Madness, you know, and then you'd pick up some characters that were still around. You'd follow, you know, whoever was in power then and you'd, you'd set up new drama and new stuff to happen. And that to me seems more enticing than filling in the blanks. But you never know. I mean, it may be that I get offered some money to write 12 more <laughs> books and then I just go ahead and do that. I have kind of the same attitude about prequels. Like, uh, you know, obviously... I can't, I, I put most things back to Star Wars for some reason, because that's just what I grew up with. But we got the, we got to know all the background of Darth Vader. And you know what? It demystified a lot of things. It wasn't cool. So now they're all like, why don't you want this like Boba Fett movie? I'm like, because I liked it. I don't know anything about them. It's what makes them cool, you know? So that's yeah. just how I always go. I, I can definitely see where you're coming from there. I mean, they were classic prequels in the sense they didn't actually really tell you anything you didn't know already. Right, right. Just they just made it look bad. You know, I mean, it would have been better had they not bothered.
in hindsight, I say that now, but back then I was like, yeah, more Star Wars, you know. Of course. So of course. Who or what would you say inspired the character of Nikomo Casca? That's one of my personal favorites. So I'm very interested if this just out of the, you just pull this one out of the air or is there like a person or something and another character maybe that influenced it? I mean, they're always, uh, you know, uh, very rarely have I written a character, even a sort of secondary character that was, you know, somebody that I knew or some figure you know, precisely just transposed. I mean, they're usually a, a mixture of all kinds of different ideas. And I mean, Cosgar, I suppose he just, he grew out of, you know, reading a lot about um, Renaissance Italy and the uh, condottieri, these mercenary generals who were very kind of uh, influential and important in the politics of that time. Um, a lot of them had been fighting in the in the Hundred Years War, you know, so they were British and French soldiers who had fought in the Hundred Years War, ended up with nothing to do. And so they'd kind of wandered into Italy sort of to make mischief, really. And they were a cross between, you know, soldiers and gangsters. Quite a few of them betrayed their leaders and then sort of took over the place. So, you know, Milan was, was uh, kind of stolen by this guy, Francesco Sforza, who uh, was a was a condottiero, a, a mercenary general, and there was this guy, Sir John Hawkwood, who was a famous British general who ended up fighting for uh, Florence for many years in Italy, and so he was a kind of combination of various figures of that kind, and and the general, just the general feel of these guys who came in from outside, who had very different moral system, if any, compared to the people they were working for and cause chaos and the sort of collapse of civilization, partly. So, you know, Machiavelli blamed, um, well, both the, the mercenaries and the reliance on mercenaries for the parlous state of, of Italy in that period. You know, he thought mercenaries were appalling and you didn't, you know, you'd be destroyed by them. So in wartime, you would be you were betrayed by them and in peacetime, they would kind of despoil your own lands. And so... They were just these incredibly unreliable figures, but also quite dynamic and charismatic figures, you know, surprising and outsiders who sort of operated outside of the, the politics of the time. So I was fascinated by that. And, and Cosgrove, I suppose, was was a take on that, especially he appears initially in Before They Hanged and, and Last Argument at Kings. And so I hadn't given a huge amount of thought at that stage. He was just, you know, based loosely on those those sort of characters. And him as a sort of drunk and uh, a weird upside down guy who is at his worst in safety in peacetime and at his best when he's, you know, his life is on the line, he's in this uh, in, in terrible danger. I don't know, that just kind of emerged as I, was, as I was writing him. It seemed to fit the character. And I suppose, you know, it draws on all kinds of Errol Flynn type uh, archetypes of these you know action men of the 50s with the big mustache it pulls in all kinds of stuff and then when i wrote better of cold you know he, he developed that a bit more uh i'd read a lot more about mercenaries of that era and so on and so you know he developed more in his relationship with monza developed and then later he just seemed like the ideal character to to bring back in red country though in a very different role i guess that's a very nuanced answer for someone that's considered like drunk Jack Sparrow, you know, and then my favorite drunk uncle. <laughs> my favorite drunk uncle. I mean, yeah, maybe, you know, I think he did start off as quite a simple character, but he, he quickly became a little bit more complicated and conflicted. The and trope with him throwing the knife has got to be one of my favorite little side arcs I've ever seen. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, the, the the knife throwing was always worked well, and you know, I, I personally I really like his kind of his own little revenge plot hmm. within Best Served Cold. I mean, Best Served Cold is kind of really unfair because you know Monza has to do all the heavy lifting of the story. She has to be the engine of the story. She has to make the decisions. She has to have a, an arc and a movement. You know, so there's an awful lot that character needs to do, which makes it a difficult character to write and a difficult character to like, I think, in a way. Whereas Koska can just breeze in and be funny and treacherous and, you know, steal every scene. So he's always st stolen every scene, Koska, for some reason. I don't think it's very much of a hot take to say Glock is probably your your most popular character. Him or Logan, I think, would be most people's favorite. So this yeah. viewer would like to know, where the hell did you come up with the idea for his teeth? 
for Glockter's teeth. The fact that they're, the, you know, they're kind of taken out alternately. Do you know, I'm not even sure. <laughs> I'm not even sure I can remember. I apprehend to just be someone who had been tortured or maybe that, that the character was just like, originally that was Certainly in the plans. That. I mean, he grew partly out of uh, being laid up with a bad back for a couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, I, I was, I had a bad back. I couldn't really move. And uh, I, I sort of struggled to the toilet on one occasion. It took me about to about half an hour to kind of get from the room I was in to the toilet, piss, and then return. Or maybe probably took half an hour each way. And as I was there, I was thinking, this is like really bad. And I was feeling very angry and annoyed. And I started thinking about how you'd feel if that was your yeah. everyday reality, you know? And how sort of terrifying that would make you, how totally careless you would be of anyone else's pain or suffering. And I don't know, that just started to play into this notion I had about, about torture in fantasy and about consequences generally, you know? Like if you see torture in fantasy, oftentimes it's quite titillating, it's quite fetishized. And oftentimes it doesn't leave much of a mark. It's about causing someone pain. But, you know, torture in the first law is not, the pain is almost incidental. It's a kind of ultimatum you're giving. I'm going to absolutely fuck you up mm. unless you do exactly what I want you to do immediately. And so Glock to someone who is living with the irreversible consequences of that, you know, and he's, he's living with the consequences of violence, really. I mean, a lot of fantasy sees this quite heroic, shiny take on violence. You know, Aragorn, he can be a violent man. He's a sword guy. He swords a lot of orcs, you know, and yet having been a sword guy for some time, he can return to ordinary life and be a, you know, a good king and a loving husband and all that stuff. He doesn't really end up with much in the way of consequences. And of course, in real life, people do suffer a lot of consequences. People who are very, very good at murdering other people with edged weapons are often not contributing members of society mm. at other times. And so, you know, Glockta was about consequences of violence. What happens when someone's been, you know, really messed up in war, after war, and Logan, you know, similarly is a, is a guy who is an addict really with violence and can't escape it. And this sort of brings the awful consequences of it down endlessly. And we it's love when it when that happens. Alive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I start to feel a little bit like Glock to myself. The older I get, every time I see the stairs that come up to my office, I'm like, fucking stairs. I said, some people argue that stairs are the real villain of, of that series, by the way. So. Well, I think so. I mean, they're, they're certainly... You know, you can't reason with them. They can never be beaten. They'll always be there. This one actually made me laugh out loud when I read it. Your characters seem to shit themselves a lot. Why does everyone have such a hard time going to the bathroom in this world? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think because it's something that just never gets mentioned, you know, in Lord of the Rings. When did when did Frodo piss? When did Frodo George R. R. Martin say this? He's like, I never got the feeling that anyone was horny in Lord of the Rings. So yeah, that's yeah. A take on that. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, Frodo gets scared, but he doesn't he doesn't piss his pants. <laughs> I I see him as the sort of guy who would do that. Maybe Aragorn would do that. Maybe Aragorn would piss his pants at Helm's Deep, you know, waiting for the charge. Because a lot of soldiers do. It's very common. Very common. Um, a lot of very brave and heroic soldiers do. It's a routine thing. And so you know, it just seemed like that was something that, that was interesting and could do a covering a little bit. And, um, you know, especially in this uh, a world that's very different from ours, where plumbing is not something everyone has the benefit of. Mm. What's it like? What does it feel like? It's a way to differentiate that world from ours. And it's a way to get in the heads of the characters, you know, because it may not be something you need to hear about from a story standpoint all the time, but it just helps to give a sense of who the people are. And that's really what I'm most interested in getting into the heads of the characters and seeing what their concerns and their way of seeing the world is and sort of hearing their voices as, as unedited as possible. And so it should include those things. Hey, I don't feel like it's a good first law book until there's a good pants shitting, if I'm being honest. So. Totally agree. Yeah. I've often described it as, you know, David Eddings, but with more people shitting themselves. <laughs> 
All right, this one's kind of loaded. Are there particular 19th century authors such as Charles Dickens or Elizabeth Gaskell who influenced the caste conflict, enclosure, and industrialization portrayed in Age of Madness? Whoa, whoa, hardcore, man. Um, yeah, I mean, there certainly are. So I've always been a big sort of Dickens reader. So definitely he is one who's always influenced me a lot. And, um, you know, clearly he was tackling some of this industrial kind of uh, I mean they tend to be later in a sense so I mean the stuff I'm tackling is in a way a little bit earlier it's more kind of 18th century even late 17th century it's it's water power and kind of very early industrial revolution as opposed to the full-on London smogs and kind of steam power and rails and that kind of thing so a lot of these authors are a bit later but I mean certainly um, Dickens is one and Gaskell, you know, north and south, and, and um, she deals very directly with uh, a lot of the, you know, the mills and the, and the class struggle that was going on in Britain at that time. And that's all quite influential on me. Um, so, I mean, certainly there were quite a few writers. And then there were also, you know, some French writers writing about the, the French Revolution that uh, I, was, I was somewhat influenced by and all kinds of others, too. There's always a a range that goes into anything, I guess, with, with a book like this. Which first law character would you most like to go out with beers with? There is much less loaded of a question there, or getting loaded question. Who would I most like to go for beers with? Oh, it's Bayaz, isn't it? You know? I would say Costco, but I'm afraid I'd probably end up getting stabbed. No, Costco would do that, but end in disaster. <laughs> you know, never be close to Costco. Stay, keep your distance, because he's the sort of guy that disaster just happens around him. Whereas, you know, Bayaz, it'll be all be controlled. Yeah, yeah. Nothing can go wrong. He'd pay, you know. And if you're lucky, you'd be, you'd be drawn into his schemes and become a pawn in his power play. And that's the place to be, man. Yeah, he seems like the type who would ask if you want to start a tab with, with Valent and Bonk. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, recent events politically have made me feel that, you know, ruled by um, omniscient, all-powerful, amoral wizard it's kind of, I mean, we probably could do with a few years of that. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. Sometimes you got to take your medicine, right? What yeah. was your favorite idea that you did not end up using in one of your books, at least yet? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, generally speaking, I use every idea I possibly can. And, you know, I always say the muse is visits the people who are already working. You know, inspiration and ideas come as you're working on something and are part of that project in a sense i'm not really someone who spews out loads of scenarios and ideas and half written trunk novels and plans for future work i don't really do that generally so it's hard to think of anything that i haven't used i mean on occasion you'll have an idea for a character or for something that you know you'll leave till the next book so for instance when i was writing uh um, before they're hanged and I was I, I finished the blade itself I was halfway through before they're hanged and I started trying to find a publisher for those and I spent maybe six months trying to find a publisher didn't have any luck and so um, I started working on something else you know something more focused more limited so I thought you know let's have a shorter tighter book and I started writing this kind of revenge story set in an Italian city and of course then the books got bought and I shelved that. But when it came to writing a fourth book, I was like, oh, revenge story, Italian at City, you know, I'll, I'll use all the bits I've got left over. So I tend to just use ideas up as I have them. And if I had a good idea that I hadn't used, I mean, why would I share it with the world? Good, my, good, good answer. Uh, do you ever feel bad for your characters? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. They kind of get this. They kind of had it coming, right? <laughs> well, some of, some of them certainly do have it coming, but I mean, they're not people. They're, they're there for the entertainment of the reader. I've made them up. And so, you know, they're made up for a purpose. Um, and if the most effective thing to do is to kill them or treat them in some horrible way, which it often is, then that's what needs to be done. You know, it's, it's a bit like saying, do you feel sorry for your saw when you saw a log in half? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, not really, and I needed to saw the log, you know, so that's, that's what the characters are there for, they're tools for a purpose. I mean, I think as well, you know, as a reader, you read a book, it takes you a week or two, 
um, and you know the scenes hit you hard that you read fast um, and it happens at that pace the author's intended whereas when you write you know you spend months leading up to a scene you plan it for a long time you spend you know a few days writing it you come back to it you revise it so this constant long process of getting things right and um so it's a kind of slightly bloodless task you know you don't get this this moment of of high impact necessarily you get you so get an not idea like you're drown you're not drowning your own puppy here well maybe but you know i i, I sort of like to I like to take all the magical thinking out of it if I can and see it as a workmanlike skill. Like being a watchmaker, you painstakingly put it together, you know? So it's not, there's not the same passion there. So do I feel bad for the, for the characters? No. You know, sometimes people say as well, you know, you did this horrible thing. How could you do this horrible thing to this character? And I, I sort of say as a joke, well, I didn't do it. I just told you about it. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a degree at which that feels true, you know. You didn't do it. You are just, you know, relaying. Sometimes characters just do the stuff it feels like they should do, and all I can do is tell you about it. Yeah, some of your Reddit responses to some of those things are, are classic. Like, I, there was a guy who wrote, like, a 10,000-word essay about the ending of Last Argument Kings and how he would felt so betrayed, and you were just like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes less is more so what can you tell us about the devils if that's still the working name and can we make headlines by maybe getting something like a character name um can you get a character name well it's um it's a book uh containing words wow breaking it's, news guys i oh, know it's crazy isn't it i'm really <laughs> spilling the beans it's kind of it's very much a work in progress and it's a new thing and so you know, it will develop a lot and change a lot as it goes. I'm kind of halfway through a draft. And so I'm wrestling with it a little bit at the moment. It's always the difficult part when you're, you're kind of in the middle of something. And once I get to the end, I'll have a better idea what works and what doesn't and start to prune it all down and hopefully make it, make it feel better. But, you know, in some ways it's similar. It's a kind of, it features a group of mismatched squabbling anti-heroes, certainly on a questionable quest of sorts uh, but it's in a a much more kind of high fantasy well that's not quite the way to put it but there's a lot there's a lot more magic and monsters and okay. silly stuff you know there's vampires there's werewolves there's elves there's everything there's self-consciously everything and it's a bit ridiculous it's a bit silly it's both it's both nastier and more splattery than first law and also i think a bit more comedic and absurd all right just let me know when i can pre-order that sounds pretty good uh do, yeah. you, do you fan cast any particular actors in your head for first law characters and if so what are some of your selections because i can't tell you i can't think of gunner broad without seeing uh dave batiste in the beginning of blade runner 2049 with the yeah. little glasses do you have anything yeah, like yeah, that yeah I mean, usually, no, usually I, um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't give you an actor for also say, so the ones that kind of pop into my head, relatively fully formed, a kind of, it feels weird to, to, to think of who, who might play them, who the casting might be. But occasionally if I'm having trouble with a character, if I'm finding them difficult to get in their head somehow, if they're seeming quite flat or uninteresting, I might seek out a, a certain character, a certain actor that I like or that I've seen in something and has some of the, some of that energy that I want, find a few stills that I can just stick on the screen while I'm writing from that point of view. And it can help you just somehow get in the head, get in the visual, visualize what they're like, get a feel for what they might be like. And so that can certainly be useful. Funnily enough, the Dave Batista thing. So I'd written some of A Little Hatred already, maybe even the whole thing, I can't remember. And then I saw that film and I've always liked him as an actor. I've always thought he was good. Um, but obviously there was just something about that particular styling with, you know, the huge guy with the tiny little glasses and the kind of idea of this huge guy with the weak eyesight who needs these delicate little glasses perched on his nose to really see what's going on. Just seemed to really fit that character and it gave a slightly new way in, you know, he has the, he has the glasses on, but then he takes the glasses off. 
And once the glasses come off, he can't really see the world. He can't really see what's going on. It just seemed to fit really nicely with the character. And so that, that particular one was, you know, definitely on my mind. Another question I got multiple times. Why are there no maps published for First Law? <laughs> I mean, there are, right? There's a, there's a, there's a map around Sharp Ends. No, looking... Maybe they skip, maybe they skip the, uh, the standalone. See, guys, why you don't skip the short stories, guys? Uh, there you go, you see. So Sharp Ends has a map of the whole world right around it. And, um, you know, the heroes and Best of Cold and Red Country, likewise, they've all got a, a map on the original oh, cover. Read the the original. I, I see. I've gotten so used to it. I just, I just Googled circle the world and went to the images and I found one. So uh, I, I, mm, I don't know. Who doesn't have Google these days? I, I, I mean, seriously, why there was no map originally is largely because, you know, my editor at the time or, or Simon Spanton, who was running the imprint at the time, he just wasn't a big fan of maps in fantasy books. He felt like they were a, an automatic kind of thing people put in just to advertise this is that kind of book that has a map, you know, and he felt like the book's written well, you kind of don't need one. And from my point of view, I was happy not to have one because I felt as though I was trying to do fantasy in close up. You know, if you look at a John Ford Western, it's, it's often told in these big wide shots, you know, the huge world, the big mountains, the, the great rivers and, and the little figures, sometimes a little bit lost in the landscape. That's how Lord of the Rings can feel sometimes. It's about the world, but, these little figures that are kind of indistinct. I wanted to do Sergio Leone, big sweaty close up of the eyes. You know, I wanted it to feel intimate. And so there's not really a wider shot you can start with in a big map of the whole world. It felt like the wrong end of the binoculars, if you know what I mean. Makes sense. So I was happy to go without map. Now you've been kind of cryptic about this in the past, and that's led a lot of people to assume that maybe someone is kind of sitting on these rights, but these people know that obviously uh, what is the deal with TV film adaptation. And if someone does currently have the rights, do they have any intention to use them or are they just sitting on so no one else uses them? Are you allowed to talk about it? Well, I mean, the problem with this stuff is always, if you do talk about it, it just becomes the subject of further conversation that you can't necessarily have. And people then ask you what's going on constantly and you can't say, or there's nothing to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, the rights exist and are owned and stuff is happening, but you know, stuff is always happening. Mm. Maybe exciting things will happen any minute. Maybe they won't. It's hard for me to be sure. And I've been around this block a couple of times and been on the verge of, you know, exciting things and then the exciting things have gone away. And so I've kind of learned the best thing to do is just pretend nothing's happening. Act as though nothing's happening. And then maybe one day you can announce something when there really is something serious to announce. Wow, that's the best non-answer of all time right there. I like that. <laughs> you should be an author. Uh, if you could write yeah. a story in any other author's universe, living or dead, which would it be? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's always it's always a bit difficult, but you know, similar question people sometimes ask is, is there a character you wish you could kind of steal? Is there a character you wish you'd written? I mean, the thing is that writing's so personal, it's very hard to kind of imagine writing someone else's character. You know, the characters I respond to really well are often characters I never would have thought of, you know, because they're so alien in the way they think or, you know, they they have a voice that is totally unique and individual. And so likewise, a world, it feels a bit strange. I mean, as I say, I'm not, I'm not that interested in world in a way anyway. I suppose one I've always loved is Jack Vance's Die on Earth. Just such a bizarre, weird setting and with such weird characters. But again, I think I, re I respond to it because the characters, because the Kugel were clever and other characters in that setting are so you know, they're funny and they're weird and they're strange. And, and that's what I tend to react to. It's more characters than worlds on the whole. So I don't think there is one that I would be desperate to write in. There are loads that I love and find fascinating and interesting, but um, I kind of feel the need to write in my own ones, really, I suppose. All right. Well, if I had a fan wish, I think I'd like to see you take a stab at Conan. I think Conan would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Conan's interesting. Um I've always been a bit more of a Fafford and the Grey Mouser guy when it comes to sword and sorcery. 
Conan, I find a little bit, a little bit lacking in humor, perhaps. Mm. You know, it's it's kind of quite. Because well, I always consider Logan kind of like Conan, but with one-liners. You know. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think Conan I've always thought of as, as quite kind of self-regarding. Takes himself a bit seriously, Conan. Definitely. You know, I, I like I like a guy more like Fafford who's who's sort of messing around. Yeah. All right. Now, I got some variation of this question a lot. I'm sure you've heard as well. If George R. R. Martin gave up and asked you to ghostwrite the last two Song of Ice and Fire books, would you do it? Would I do it? Uh, I mean, here's another one that is kind of... Uh, 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 I mean, I think probably not. B because... I, I just, it's, it feels so personal. I don't, I don't think I could do a good job of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's always going to be my, my crap version of Game of Thrones, you know. I, I can, and I'd rather write my own crap version of Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing quite successfully for many years now. Um, so it would have to, it, I, it, no, I, I don't think, I don't think so. I don't think I'd, I'd want to. And I, I'm sure I wouldn't ever be asked, which makes it a bit of a, a bit of a moot point. I think there's the reason it always like, comes up is there's this old interview that used to be on YouTube and it's gone now. It was a discussion with you and George R. R. Martin, like a roundtable discussion. I think that's where people start saying, hey, this guy gets it, this world so much. I think maybe he could do it if George, you know, heaven forbid he leaves us before he finishes or if he just gives up. Yeah, I mean, was, we know each other a little bit. Um, you know, I interviewed him once for um, for Sky when, when Game of Thrones first started and uh, he and he interviewed me in his in his cinema that he has in uh, in Santa Fe, and you know we've we've run into each other a few times and had dinner a few times, that kind of thing. So you know, I, I know him a little bit. He's a great guy. He's, he's always been very supportive of me, and you know, so yeah. yeah but he, he knows a lot of other writers too. You know, he's he's generally quite involved in the community. He likes hanging out with writers. Likes kind of supporting the the new generation of writers and so on. So. Yeah, but you know, it's a huge gulf of, between that and and saying, you know, I'd, I'd like you to raise my baby, right? Sure. Which is sort of the level we're talking about here. So I'm sure there's other people he'd sooner ask, but he's, I think he's said that he he wouldn't want it done by someone else anyway, hasn't he? So I don't know. The whole, there's something slightly distasteful about the whole thing. Yeah, you know, it feels really like uh, feels like marrying your brother's widow or something. I don't know. I know it's <laughs> just a little bit odd. Yeah, absolutely. Has there ever been an instance of writing a scene where you think maybe you might have went too far and you had to scale it back? Because I'm betting this answer is no, but yeah. I think it's probably no. I mean, it would depend what reason. Because, you know, I'm always, I'm always revising and rewriting. I'm a big rewriter. And so, you know, I'll, I'll rethink things and redo things for all kinds of reasons. Um, for the general pacing of the book, for the, you know, for the balance of different scenes. But generally, you're always trying to get more out of things. You're trying to make things more intense, more affecting, more powerful, more scary, you know, depending on what the scene is. So very rarely do you think, well, I can't, I can't hardly think ever of thinking, oh, that would be cool. Oh, but should I? Mm. Could I? Mm. Shall I? Dare I? Because, you know, I think the thing as well is that when I first wrote The Blade itself, you know, um, and I was trying to get it published and not having a lot of luck, I started thinking, hmm, is this too, is it too nasty? Is it too violent? Is it too uncomfortable, a mixture of humour and uh, unpleasantness? But I think, you know, the middle ground of, of what was commercial had actually moved quite a long way between 1990 and 2000 um and you know there's there's a lot of series that cover really dark stuff i mean game of thrones is about as dark as you're likely to get in many you know in, in some parts so i don't think anything's particularly off limits really i don't think you're going to get yourself in big trouble doing stuff there'll always be people who you know will get offended by some things there'll be people who it's just not to their taste but you know you can't write to the imagined taste of someone you don't even know because you've no idea what will go down well and what won't um you've just got to kind of write what feels interesting and exciting to you and you know i like things that are quite intense and 
and dangerous. If you're going to cover those subjects of war and kind of, you know, sex and violence, and if you're going to do those things, if you're going to go there, then I think you kind of owe it to everyone to go there in a way that's honest and sort of feels authentic and feels risky and, and a little bit dangerous because otherwise what's the point? Yeah. I read uh, Mark Lawrence's broken empire after yours. And I was like, nah, Joe never really went too far. Uh, definitely not by comparison. So I don't know if you've read those or not, but uh, your characters are considered some of the most compelling in fantasy. So do you agree that writing characters is your strong point or is there another aspect of your writing talents that you feel gets overlooked? Do I have a weak point? I don't think so. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, probably. In, I think that's certainly the one that people bring up is characters. And that's the thing, as I say, that I kind of feel is most important as a reader, which isn't to say that it's the same for everyone. Of course, it's not. The fact that everyone has a very different take on this is what makes the world interesting. And the fact that, you know, people respond to different kinds of writing is what makes the world interesting. So, I mean, characters definitely are the focus. And I feel like if, if the characters are working, then I'm not worried, you know, because I feel like, you know, a book with great characters will be interesting, even if anything else is, is kind of a little bit deficient, you know, you can have a, a poor plot with great characters is still interesting to me. Whereas a great plot, but poor characters is boring within 10 seconds, you know? So characters is key, but I think, you know, part of that is dialogue. So, what makes a character good? Well, chiefly dialogue. So characters and the relationships between them and the way they talk to each other. And then of course, you know, voice, which is the kind of internal monologue, not dialogue, but this kind of internal thought, the dialogue with the reader, if you like, the direct dialogue between character and reader, I suppose is, is part of it as well. So, you know, character and dialogue, I suppose, are the things I find and dialogue is what I find easiest and most natural to write. If I write a chapter, I tend to do the dialogue first then fill in the other bits. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm pretty good at action generally as well. Although it's funny how you tend to feel after a while that you're hitting the same beats with action. It's harder to keep the action fresh and interesting than it is the dialogue. Somehow every conversation is instantly different but every sword fight has a very great danger of being very much the same. So you've always got to be finding new ways to do things with the action. Thanks, Floss. And I do have a couple of uh, Shattered Sea questions. So, uh, For sure, first, I did write those too. Do you consider that a YA series? Because I hear a lot of people call it YA, and a lot of people are like, it's not YA. It's just not as messed up as First Law. What would you say on that? I don't know, really. I mean, I wrote it sort of as YA, but, you know, I wrote it, as the kind of book that I would have enjoyed at 15 or 16, mm -hmm. which is substantially pretty similar to what I enjoy now. Um, and really a lot of it was about writing something shorter and tighter and more focused and seeing if I could kind of boil down the approach to epic fantasy into something a bit more short, uh, a bit more tight, fewer points of view and so on, and had a slightly different style. So I guess they're kind of why, hey, but it's interesting, you know, in some territories and countries there, very much sold as YA. Often in countries where I was re pretty successful with the first law already, they're sold more as adult fantasy because that's kind of the easy move, you know, to sell them to the people who already like my other things. Sure. So it's kind of varies. I don't know. It's like Grimdark, you know, when you see it, who, who knows what they are. Uh, so, Thorn Bathu is my favorite female character in fantasy. Was Thorn inspired by a real woman? And if so, is she single? Was she inspired by a real woman? No, not really. I mean, I, th I think she was kind of inspired by the thought of if you, you know, were going to have a woman who was really going to go toe to toe with male warriors, with top end, you know, infamous male warriors, what qualities would she need to have? Who would she need to be? to make that believable, you know, and to overcome the kind of gap of mass and strength there. Um, and Thorne sort of the answer, you know, you'd need that incredible single-mindedness, battering ram quality to you. And so it's really the story of how, you know, a, a female character could sort of plausibly get there, I think was, was how that character came about. 
I got a couple that are kind of channel related here. We're doing a read along for Blood Meridian right now. So this right, right. viewer would like to know, what do you say to people who do not like or do not finish Blood Meridian? I don't say anything to him. Why would I, why would I speak to such people as that? <laughs> why, would I, why would I waste my breath on such people? No, I mean, Blood Meridian is tough. Blood Meridian's tough, you know, it's, it's not easy. So I've got no uh, disrespect for anyone who just, you know, doesn't like what it is. I just finished it and I wouldn't say that I didn't like it as much as I'm not sure I got it. I understood it. It was just like the way I kind of described it was it was like, say you're playing Red Dead Redemption and you were just going around being the biggest bastard that you could. And then someone novelized it for you. That's kind of how I felt like it's just just being. And you were told awful. the story by a barnstorming preacher. Yeah. <laughs> That's the feel to, to my mind. I mean, it's, it's certainly not his easiest book. I mean, The Road, I think, is is a kind of better. Yeah, that's where I started. Yeah. In, in many ways, you know, that that kind of lands more. That does leave you kind of baffled and feeling a bit dirty. Um, so it's not for everyone. And the big channel read along we're doing right now is Malazan. So people want to know if you ever have you ever dabbled in Malazan? And if so, do you consider it grimdark? And if so, are you willing to have a cage match with Steven Erickson to see who is on the right side of the discussion? Because I called uh, the Guardians of the Moon somewhat grimdark, and Mr. Erickson still dropped in my comments and said, absolutely, I do not write grimdark. And I'm like, these books are really messed up. But, oh, someone pet a dog at the end, so they're not grimdark? I, I don't know. So we've just kind of had a, a going around about that. So, Well, I mean, I haven't read them, I must confess, because they're kind of in that period of fantasy that happened, you know, after I largely stopped reading fantasy. So everything between Game of Thrones or, you know, uh, Storm of Swords and now is generally stuff I, I didn't read so much. So I kind of just missed out on David Gemmell and Steve Erickson and Robert Jordan were all people I didn't particularly read at the time. So I, I haven't read Malazan. I've, I've met Steve a couple of times. He's a great guy, very clever guy, very thoughtful on these subjects. I mean, I, I, the weird thing is, I would say I didn't write Grimdark, you know, which is to say I didn't set out to write mm. Grimdark by any stretch of the imagination. I set out to write an epic fantasy that was just my version, and that's kind of the way it went. So it depends what you emphasize. Having seen some discussion of Malazan and in various different places, I think Steve would no doubt say it's kind of, it's not cynical. You know, so it's gritty and grim and dark and violent, has those aspects, but it doesn't have the sort of withering cynicism about human nature that some people think Grimdark needs. But then, as I say, who knows what Grimdark is? How can you, you know, define any book as, as something if you don't really have a proper definition of it in the first place? Right on. So uh, what are your views on dealing with critics and how do you manage to stay so positive even while you're still on Twitter. By the way, I love your one-star review tweets. What do I think about critics? I mean, the thing is, when you, when you start as a writer, you have this idea, I think, that things are either good or bad. Everyone says everything's subjective, but no one really believes that. They believe there is an objective truth, and it's what they think. Sure. You know, and uh, so when you actually put a book out there, you realize that people just have totally different ways of, of reading stuff, to respond to totally different things, have strange opinions that seem completely strange to you. And, you know, nothing's going to be loved by everyone. Your job is not to write something that everyone loves. Your job is to write something you love and then hope that some people respond to it. So over time, you, 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 you know, you, you stop being too bothered by bad reviews. I mean, for new books, you know, like a new baby going out into the world, you're always worried for that, for that little baby. You know, it hasn't grown up yet, can't defend itself. And so bad reviews for new books always sting a little bit. And sometimes something will land, but often it's because it's true. So, you know, there's, there's often things to be learned from bad reviews. There's probably a lot more to learn from bad reviews than there is from good ones, you know, often doesn't mean that you have to slavishly kind of obey or take seriously every review that you get. Um, but it's sensible to have your ears open because for me, what I'm always trying to do is get better, you know, and improve. And so, you know, your bad reviews may give you some insight into how you might go about doing that. Um, but also sometimes they're funny. You know, they are just funny sometimes. And if you can't, like if, if you take yourself so seriously, you know, that you can't 
have a laugh at, at people hating you, then life will just be too hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people ask why, why, how do I laugh off criticism? Like, because it's hilarious that you actually wasted that kind of energy. I mean, obviously, you're a professional. I'm just some dude, you know. So I was like, yeah, it's easy for me to laugh it off. But uh, the one star, the one star reviews are are quite humorous. Yeah, and it's experience. You know, you, you get better at it. Your skin gets thicker, and you build up a sort of backlog of people who do like your stuff. And over time, it just doesn't seem to matter that much that one or other person doesn't like it. And then, of course, the, the big, thick sheaves of, of royalty statements are very absorbent. When you cry, they just they just dab that stuff right up and it's gone. I'm so sorry about this question. Uh, this, this user has been quite prevalent and he's just read the series for the first time. And he wants to know why you chose to use the word squelch so much during those scenes. Well, because, I mean, that is a that is a to my mind, a good faith onomatopoeic descriptor for the sounds that, that we're hearing, right? <laughs> so it just seems straightforwardly honest, which is what, what I'm kind of about. And I think, you know, that's sort of the approach to violence and to everything else. So why would it not be the approach to sex, you know? I get really bored by shiny, lovely, transformative sex scenes. It's like, man, what is this? <laughs> this is dull. It's again a little bit like the thing of, you know, uh, every happy family is identical, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, right? I mean, every shiny transformative sex scene is the same, but bad sex scenes all have some different personality to them. I just find it more interesting. All I'll say is poor Stephen Pacey. We'll get to Stephen Pacey here in a minute. Uh, one of my favorite sayings that I have kind of adjusted to my, my regular life, obviously you always hear the big ones say one thing about this or, you know, better to do it. Than the fear that. One that I use is actually from Pharaoh where I say, good for fucking you, like all the time. So I've got to ask, will we ever see Pharaoh again? Well, never say never. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. You know, uh, my, my approach to this kind of thing has always been that, you know, I use the characters for the purpose of the story and then if they're still alive and kicking and around in the world, if the next story feels like they need that character, you know, if, uh, I think about what characters I need for the next story. And then if I've got someone on the shelf who fits the bill, why not use one that you've, that there's got to be aware on it, mm. you know? So we read, I didn't necessarily have a mind to bring Logan back. Spoiler alert mm. in red country. I needed a used up amount of violence, right? And it so happened I had one on the shelf. So it would have been mad not to use it, it seemed to me. Why buy a new axe when you've got a fantastic axe just sitting there sure. waiting to be sure. sharpened up again? So, you know, if Pharaoh, if a story demands her presence, then no doubt she will appear. I uh, lost where I was. There was a really good one here. Okay, about Stephen Pacey. Uh, how much yeah. feedback or influence do you have on how Stephen Pacey records your audiobooks? Because say one thing for Stephen Pacey, say that he is the best in the business. Well, I mean, you know, I'm there in the in the room directing, you know, giving know, okay. him uh, lines. So he time. says the character name's correct, yes? I mean, well, I'm right there good. directing him. He doesn't say a word without my say, so no, I'm never there. I'm not there at all. I have no impact. I have no input at all. Uh, or at least certainly initially I had no input. He just did it the way he wanted to do it. And uh, I was fully expecting to be kind of embarrassed because hearing someone else read your stuff is kind of embarrassing. Sure. But he was just brilliant at it right from the start. I mean, he was brilliant at it. He gets it. He gets what I'm trying to do. He has fantastic timing. He gets the balance between the, the unpleasantness and the humor, you know, and he gets the, the humor and brings the humor out and just does great voices. I mean, he's brilliant. Um, but I have very little input into it. You know, they go and do those, the recordings in four or five days. Occasionally there's a couple of questions, but generally he just does what he wants. And I think that's the way it should be in a way. It's like with artists, you know, you get the best results when you don't try to micromanage when you let them do their thing with it, you know, and that's where, where the fun is, seeing what someone else's interpretation is. Do you get sad when people recommend the audiobooks over actually reading them? No, not at all. No, I'm delighted if people want to read it in any way. And, you know, 
the audio is becoming a bigger and bigger part of it is. of all writing. It was a time when it was kind of truck drivers and the blind, really, with a 20 CD set. Hold on, I've got one over here somewhere. There you go. He just wants to show off this bookshelf, you guys. And I don't mind. Best served cold. Wow. On on 22 CDs. <laughs> you don't see a lot of these anymore. 27 and a half hours unabridged. Yeah, now you just press a button and it just shows up on your phone. It's amazing. Well, that's it. I mean, and everyone's got a phone, so everyone's reading them. And, and I think, you know, both in the US and the UK for these latest books, it's about an even split three ways between ebooks, hardcovers, and audiobooks in the first few weeks of sales. So, I mean, you know, it's a third of the market, at least. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm totally happy if people want to consume it that way. It works for me. Do you still do any work with Iron Maiden? Because I believe you used to do video editing for them and up the irons. Up the irons? Uh, you, no, I mean, I don't. I, I've, I've stopped. So I, I used to be a video editor and I did a lot of um, documentary and live music stuff. And I did a few, uh, mostly documentaries and a couple of concerts for the Maiden back in the day. But it's been quite a while since I did any of that sort of work now. Full-time writer. Uh, is the humor in First Law books reflective of your own daily humor in life? I mean, yeah, uh, up to a point. I mean, the thing is, all these people, all these characters are me in a way, aren't they? Which is a sort of horrible thought. Um, but they all, for whatever reason, kind of come out of my head. So, yeah, I mean, they they can't really think anything that I don't think or say anything that I haven't thought of. Although they feel that even to me, like they are individuals with their own way of expressing themselves. But I think the humor is what puts it over the top. I, I, I can never answer the what is actually grimdark question, but a yeah. recommendation I got a lot after your series was Broken Empire by Mark Lawrence. And I was like, I don't know, guys, it just feels like nihilism to me. Not really. Like the characters are just insane. And I think thinking back on it, I was like, I think it's just because the characters never made me laugh. I don't know. Your characters always have such ridiculous things. They say that any other author says them. It's just like, what in the world is this? But for some reason, they, I feel like they, it's the proper amount of levity in a really hopeless situation that isn't to a point where someone would be like, no one would say that in this instance. So I don't know. Maybe that, maybe that's it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I've always thought humor was really important in, in books and, you know, it was a bit lacking from the fantasy I was reading as a, as a kid that could end up being, you know, ending up a little bit pompous mm. at times. And so uh, I like things that aren't an out and out comedy, but you know, certainly the, the characters have some, have some wit about their own situation. Speaking of, of pompous here, what is it like having people declare you the best at something in this case, being the best grimdark author? Is it humbling or does it put unnecessary pressure on you to keep getting better? Well, I mean, it's just the fact, isn't it? There's no, <laughs> that's no favor to me just to state the fact I am the best. And so obviously it's just objective truth to say so. All right. Have you ever considered a happy ending for a first law book, which I'll interject and say, I thought red country had a pretty optimistic ending. It had a really good farewell to a beloved character. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What I mean, you know, I think so. And I think they're often, um, I think often people are often a little more negative about the endings than they need to be. I mean, they are quite dark endings. Obviously, the first law is kind of my reverse take on epic fantasy. So it sort of has the reverse of the neat, happy endings that you often get in those books. Um, and it's pretty dark, but there's still glimmers of, of hope and positivity in there. I think so. Clock to an RD, you know, I don't want to I don't want to spoil too much, do I? But you know, there are things that are somewhat positive and yeah i'd say red country's got a pretty you know somewhat bittersweet but generally ends reasonably well I think so. Involved. so i wouldn't rule it out i mean i think the thing is you don't want to be massively predictable for withering cynicism any more than you want to be predictable for shiny heroism it becomes boring once you know exactly what you're going to get so you've always got to keep people on their toes a little bit yeah, I definitely do not want a, a Disney ending. Uh, what do you think are the rules for passing the torch between an old group of beloved characters and new ones and continue to expand the world through them? So far, Age of Madness has done this wonderfully compared to something like The Force Awakens as a, as a random example. 
Um, I don't know if there are rules. I mean, I suppose the approach I tried to take was, you know, I try not to repeat the point of views. So if someone's been a point of view in a previous book, then generally there'll be not a point of view in a, in a later one. So, you know, I knew that the older generation of characters were going to be, you know, secondary characters up to a point. They'd be in the background. They'd be important, certainly. Um, but I wanted it to be the story of the new generation of people um, and not get obsessed with kind of paying off the fan favourites for its own sake. Um, and I think there's a natural progression of, you know, the characters start very much in the shadow of their parents, of their mentors, of this older generation. Then they, they more and more step into the light for themselves as the series goes on. So I think if there's a secret, it's that, you know, that you, you commit to the new cast. You don't get too bogged down in trying to bring in the old favourites where they're not needed. You know, you make use of them where the, if there's a slot for the parent within the story of the new character, then you can fill that slot with someone that we all know and love, but don't end up doing their story instead, you know, stick with the, the characters you've chosen to follow. That was hard for me at first. I won't lie, but the secret shows was like, Oh my God, I get to see Glockta again, you know, and it's very much a, you know, I say almost like a cameo kind of thing, which is the proper way to do it. I think with what star Wars messed up, I just felt like they just, they disrespected those legacy characters. And I don't feel like you've done that at all. So that, that, that might be part of it. I think the problem for me with the star Wars was, was that they were just bad films. <laughs> I mean, you know, if they'd been good films, it wouldn't have been a problem, but they were terrible, terrible films, especially the most recent two. I thought were just, I never thought anything would be as disappointing as the prequels. Yeah, we are on the same page there. Yeah. It has actually vindicated those in hindsight. Now I think they're almost even worse. <laughs> they're almost even worse. At least the prequels are a coherent story. Yeah. They're about something that starts at point A and ends at the end after three films. They're, they're an arc of something of importance. Those three are just like, just throw the bits in the air and film whatever falls down. I mean, they were junk. Yeah, we could probably talk about an hour about the Star Wars films, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, how do you strike the balance between the horrific violence, the heartfelt character relationships, and the humor? Does it take? Does it come naturally, or do you need to be more calculating to make sure no one element outshadows the others? Well, I think that sort of assumes that they're opposites. There is a spectrum where if you go one way, you can't go the other way. You know, it's either do you go towards funny or do you go towards violent? But I think things can be violent and funny, mm. you know? And I think when the lights are turned up, the shadows get darker. So it's about intensity and making everything as intense as you can. So rarely do I think to myself, wow, that's hilarious, but I'm gonna take it out because I want this scene to be solemn, you know? Rarely do I think that's exciting, I'm going to take it out because I want this scene to be sedate. You know, if it's exciting or it's funny, why isn't it in there? Mm. You know, it's like taking the best bits out. You leave the best bits in and then you keep going, refining the best bits to make them as intense as you can. So, you know, I think talking about humor again, it's very hard to just be funny. If someone said, write, write a funny line, you know, I, I wouldn't know where to begin with that. But, you know, the, the humor is something that, sort of occurs in reaction to what's going on. So I would never kind of say, I need this scene to be less funny or I need this scene to be less sad. I'd, I'd say, if this is a sad scene, I want it to be more sad. And then if something funny happens, I want that to be as funny as it can be. You know, the contrast between the two is what makes it interesting. So yeah, I like the way the, the inner monologue works, how it could be a completely serious scene and what they're actually saying, the quotations, what they're actually saying is serious, but then the inner monologue sentence in between is what they're thinking. And I just, I love that. It's great. It's what makes it keep it, keeps it from getting so self-serious that you're just like, it's like, no spoilers, but the first third of this, when things are going to straight to hell, it's like, wow, this could get really, really brutal. And it's like, but you have these funny little one-liners in between in their thoughts. And I always, I always love that. Made me think of body found floating by the docks or something, you know, good times, good times during chaos. Uh, why does he hate Giselle? Why do I hate Giselle? Mm. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I hate him any more than 
I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I hate him any more than I feel bad for him. Mm. You know, he is what he is. Uh, I quite, I quite like him. I quite admire him in a way. I mean, I think he's, he's got a great chin. You know, he's got a great, great chin. So he's got a fantastic chin. <laughs> uh, obviously, autobiographical. That. Um, I think he's one of the nicer guys in there. Actually, I, I would say that of the whole central cast of the first law, he's the least damaging. He's kind of he may be the best person morally. I think there's a strong argument for that. But I find him kind of ridiculous and dumb. Um, and so it's interesting, you know, do people prefer Glockter, who is ruthless and yeah. vile, but funny and self-aware? Or do they prefer Jezal, who is kind of bumbling, uh, selfish, self-absorbed, but basically inoffensive in, in most regards by comparison? They prefer Glockter. Well, I mean, that, yeah. that says something about you, not about me. That, that's what I've said. That's what I feel like a lot of other of these tales that people call Grimdark. I'm like, yeah, but see, those characters are just pieces of shit. I never find myself rooting for them. I was like, how can you make someone that's a torture <laughs> be like my favorite character in fantasy? You know, how do you do that? And, and with Jazal, I mean, just from the moment he's like thinking about how he can't, how ugly people just like annoy him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I love the character, so I don't know. Um, what do you have against happiness? A lot of assumptions on some of these questions. Yeah, aren't there? I mean, I, I've got, I, I mean, I love being happy myself. And most people want to be happy, whatever that means. But happiness is not very interesting to read about. I mean, what you want to read about a set of happy people getting on? That's not drama, really. I mean, Happiness is a goal. It's an end point, maybe, for a story. It's what people are working towards in whatever way, but it's not the it's not the journey, is it? So I suppose happiness doesn't have a lot of a role to play in a narrative, in a story, because you want people to be facing challenges, facing ordeals, right? So September the 14th, guys. Are you sad to see another trilogy come to a close or you wrote it? So because you write these all at once and then you just do the editing process, right? Well, this one I did. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the, the, the first law that I, I kind of did simply because it took that long to get, you know, signed and to get published. I pretty sure. much finished it by the time it got there. Um, but this one I wrote all as one block. I mean, it's, it's great. I'd be very happy to see it go out there and to see how people, hopefully how people react to the kind of thing as a whole, I'd be very interested to see that. Um, it feels a bit sad that it's kind of come around so fast. Yeah. You know, I worked on it for five or six years, probably. And then we had this plan to publish them yearly. Um, and it felt like, you know, I had, I had everything sorted for years to come. And then before you know it, third one's coming out. So it's kind of sad to feel, oh, it's gone. And, you know, you do a little bit get, you know, when you read a book and you finish it and you think, oh, no, they've all gone away. All my friends hmm. they have gone and left me. You get that a bit as a writer as well. I kind of miss some of those characters now they've, uh, you know, had their moment and uh, the story's finished. So you do feel a bit of a sense of, uh, a bit of a bittersweet sense of, oh, waving, waving the people away. I got like 200 pages left and I'm already starting to get sad that I'm not going to be seeing some of these characters anymore. So that kind of brings me to a, a, just a regular question here. Of these seven new POV characters, which one do you think was the most fun for you to write? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I like variety in all things, you know, so the fact that they complement each other is sort of, is sort of vital, you know, so Clover, it was very easy to write and he's in a sort of dialect and a, a style that I find I can slip into quite easily. And I, I always quite enjoy that northern milieu, if you like, that works well for me and it's quite natural to do. But he doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting, that character. He kind of just sits on his ass and uh, criticises people and, and, you know, is, is sort of clever in a slightly disinterested way. So he's an easy character to write. Um, 
also was was great fun to do just worked very well right from the start but they're all different aspects that you know work because of the balance between them so you know i don't really like savine I, I like writing from that point of view not every reader reacts well to her but i just find her interesting there's quite a lot going on some characters you know are just a lump like Leo is just a lump. He doesn't really learn or change very much. I mean, he does a bit in this book, to be fair. But, you know, Savine's constantly changing and, and developing. And I find that quite interesting because a lot of characters like, you know, a lot of characters in the first law, the whole thing was they end up exactly where they started. You know, they never learn. Logan never learns. He never changes, really. Um, Glockter... Similarly, they're not characters that really change. They're, they're fixed quantities. They're very established. They're old when we meet them and they've got a lot of history and they're not moving very far. Whereas Savine's a character who's constantly kind of changing and developing and, and likewise some of the others. So that aspect was interesting. Um, so there's no one that I would really, you know, put above the others. It's it's the diversity of the cast that makes them interesting for me. I think mine's, mine's kind of changed. Like the first book, Orso, was one of my lesser favorites. Now I think Orso is kind of my favorite POV here by the by the end. But uh, mm -hmm. I think it was something I said about Savine in uh, my Trouble Peace review was that I said she's so manipulative and calculating in that book. She makes Cersei Lancer seem like a Disney princess. So I hope that's what you were going for there. That's, the, that's, a, that's a big compliment coming from, from myself. So Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and... Uh... It'd be interesting to to hear what you think of where she ends up. I I'll be I'll be letting you know very very soon. So September the fourteenth, guys. I, he's got a a big old press tour going on right now. He's gonna be like, talking to just about everybody out there. So I, I want to pretend that I'm special, but I'm just glad this finally happened because for the longest time I heard that you just didn't like to do interviews. So I, I never really I never really reached out. So I'm glad you actually re you responded because I didn't expect it. So no, I mean I'm, I quite enjoy doing interviews. I mean talking about myself. Endlessly is one of your favorite things. <laughs> so you know, yeah, no objections here. All right. Well, uh, I very much look forward to uh, what is coming outside of First Law. I mean, obviously, I'm gonna be happy for a new First Law book, but I'm I'm interested to see, uh, that you you doing like more because this is very much a soft magic system. So from what you're telling me, it sounds like you're gonna have a little bit more of a, a magic being an emphasis in this next series. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I'd call it a hard magic system. Sure. It's kind of, in a way, even softer a system than this. There's just a lot more of it. Okay. All right. And it's kind of, it's throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. It oh, sort of, that. hopefully, will be entertaining. Without Sorry. being that guy, do you have any kind of forecast for when you think that this might be coming? Honestly, no. I mean, um, the plan, especially with this being a new world and everything, is just to, you know, work my way through it in whatever pace feels kind of comfortable and then spend some time just sitting with it and revising it and going over it and, and see how long it takes to to sort of distill and and get to a point where I'm happy with it. Um, so when that'll be, I don't know. I've got a few other pots on the boil as well, which are taking up some time here or there. So see we'll writers like yourself and John Gwynn and Mark Lawrence, those that seem to put out one book a year now, I think you just kind of started to spoil some of us that have uh, just gotten to the point well, where we got kind of jaded with a lot of fantasy authors who just kind of, I eh, just say they take their time, you know? I mean, I did with these books, put them out one a year, but I didn't write them one a year. Sure. sure. You know, they, they took a year and a half or more overall to do. So, you know, I, I can't keep that pace, you know, uh, there'll definitely be a gap before the next one. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we will all be here for it. So again, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a delight. And anytime you want to just get together and talk about Star Wars and what was wrong with, uh, with what <laughs> happened after uh, Return of the Jedi, I'm here. I am here for it for sure. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, mate. Yeah. All right. Thanks.